By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome to the first episode of our Highlander 93-94 tournament. Because we've held a tournament right here on Timmy Talks, an online event with 40 plus players. I think 45, 46, something like that. And we played a Highlander old school event. And in this episode, I'm going to show you my deck that's called Welcome to the Ether. It's a red and green deck built around Tuknir. And I'm taking on Robert and he's playing a mono black deck. But before we go to the decks, I would first like to uh, explain a little bit to you about this format. Because what we've done is we made a point system just like the Canadian Highlander. But of course, our Highlander version focuses on the old school card pool. So here you can see the points list and also the sets that are allowed in this event. So you've got Arabian Nights, Legends, Harper Prism. So those are the promo, the cards you got with the promo book. So like Mana Crypt is also on this list. You can play with Mana Crypt, with Arena, with a Nalatni Dragon. So you can play with those cards. Also, uh, you have, of course, Fallen Empires, Antiquities, The Dark, and then, of course, the core sets, ABU. And of course, reprints are allowed as well. So you can play with reprints and preprints. That is all good. And then here you see the points list. So you can spend a total of 10 points. Now, maybe you're wondering, what does Highlander mean? Well, Highlander just means there can be only one. So maybe you know the movie where there's only one, right, that can survive. And the same goes for the format. You can only play with one of each. So it's a singleton format, but then you play with a hundred cards. So only one of each except for the basic lands. And then you also have this points list. For example, if I'm playing the Black Lotus and the Ancestral Recall, I don't have any points left anymore because I can only spend 10 points. So I cannot splash the Time Walk and the uh, Mock Sapphire. I cannot do that. So the points list, of course, is here to kind of make sure that people um, get creative when making the deck and they don't all put the same like restricted and and power cards in the deck. On the other hand though, it is of course a 100 card format, so even if you play with that one Library of Alexandria, it's not going to have a big impact, you know, unless of course you're really lucky and you find it in your opening hand. It's all possible. Anyway, this is uh, the format. If you wanna know more about this, by the way, check out the description below because there you can find uh, a, a link and a description of the rules, but also a link to the tournament website. So you can check out the tournament website with all the information. Okay, um, now that that's out of the way, we are going to have a look at the decks. I've got lovely deck photos of my own deck and also of Robert's deck. Um, if maybe you want to skip this and go to the matches first, check out the deck decks later. I know some people prefer to do that. The easiest way to do this is by checking out that same description below that I just talked about. There you can find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games. So if you click on there, It'll take you straight to the games. And for now, I'm going to continue with the deck decks. And I'm going to start with the deck of Robert. Guess it's black. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Robert. So it's called Guess It's Black. It's mono black with artifacts. And I'm liking that approach. I think if you're playing, uh, you know, a hundred card singleton format, old school, where color fixing is really difficult, especially when you're not playing with green. I think it's a good decision to go mono colored. Uh, that's probably going to make uh, Robert's deck very consistent, you know, and that's what you want. There's a good curve in this deck if you're looking at the creatures. He's got his one drops, two drops, three drops. It is a bit more, I would say, on the controlling side than on the aggro side, right? But it does have that good curve. So it's really a mid-range deck. And when we're looking at how he spent his points, he spent four points on the Demonic Tutor, five points on the Library of Alexandria, and one point on the Strip Mine. So those are the 10 points in total. And I think Demonic Tutor is just, it's golden, right? In this in this format. Well, when you're playing a 100 card singleton format, the Demonic Tutor can give you so many options. Then when we're looking at the cards, I mean, I'm just seeing a lot of good cards, right? Nightmare is really good in this format. Uh, you know, when you're playing, of course, you're monocolored. Uh, there are a lot of swamps in the game. He's playing with 33 swamps. Um, Ashes to Ashes is really good. It's a two for one. What I'm also liking in this deck is that I'm seeing a lot of pinging opportunity to Kumach Witches, of course, but also the Pestilence. I'm seeing the Rod of Ruin. All those cards, they work together quite well. Also with the Weakness, for example. So there could be scenarios here where Robert might be able to, you know, work together with the Rod of Ruin and Kumbach to kind of kill some creatures uh, of the opponent here, so that's quite nice. What I also like is 
the the black mana battery i love the art of that card you don't see it often so it's really cool to see it being played in formats like this also a card like raids raise dead a card you don't see often in the regular old school because of swords to plowshares but i think raise dead is also quite useful here because you know if they play with swords it's only going to be one anyway and um just to get back to the black mana battery what i love about it as well is it goes together really well with a card like drain life but also it goes together quite well with uh, howl from beyond so i mean this is looking like a solid list i'm also liking that um uh, uh what's it called again the bone the bone club the bone you know what I mean, the card from the dark, I mean, you can tap and then all creatures get minus one, minus O until end of turn. Uh, the bone flute, that's the word, the bone flute. Uh, really, really cool card. Love the art, love the colors. And again, I think against my deck, it's really good because I'm playing red, green aggro. So I've got a lot of like one, uh, one, one creatures, two, two creatures. Um, and, and I want to kind of swarm my opponent, right? With a lot of creatures from the start. So that bone flute could be useful. Of course, this is a 100 card singleton format, so the chances of Robert actually finding the Bone Flute and, and being able to use it is slim, but still, it is a good card. If he can find it, it's going to be very useful uh, for him. Well, this is the, the deck of Robert. Beautiful deck picture, by the way, man. You've got, a, you've got a great collection when I'm looking at this. Beautiful stuff. And now let's take a look at my deck. Welcome to the Ether. And here we see my deck, Welcome to the Ether, and that is a reference to Tuknir Deathlock, a card that's also in this deck. Actually, the deck is built around Tuknir. Uh, my idea of, of making the deck started with this card. So this is a 2-2 flyer, a legendary creature, and uh, it's actually an explorer of the ether if you read the flavor text. And what I really like about this is that it has like a mini giant growth on there, right? I can pay a green, a red, and a tap, and then target creature gains plus two, plus two until end of turn. So I think that's quite sweet. There are a few tricks in the deck with the, the Tuknir. For example, Dwarven Warriors, I can make a creature unblockable, then pump it later with the Tuknir. Or um, I also have, for example, Tracker in the deck, so I can make it a 4-4, and then it can kill out a bigger creature. But I mean, above all, I think, you know, a 2-2 flyer that can pump another creature could be useful in this deck. When we're looking uh, at the strategy of this deck, by the way, it's really your red-green strategy, right? So it is an aggro deck uh, that wants to just wants to have the perfect curve. The first three, four turns, all I really want to do is play a creature and turn a creature sideways. Play a creature, turn a creature sideways, right? I really try to swarm my opponent by playing out all my creatures. And if the game takes longer than expected, I can always win it with an X spell, right? I'm playing Fireball, Disintegrate, Dwarven Catapult, Earthquake. Uh, I'm playing with, uh, with Hurricane. I'm playing with Detonate. So th the first goal is to start of the game, I'm going to try to deploy my creatures, like I said deal some damage, and then finish it off with direct damage. Now, if that plan doesn't work, I do have a few like bigger creatures in the deck, a bit more controlling creatures, like a Cockatrice, like a Thicket Basilisk, uh, also the Killer Beast, which is a gr great way to sink my mana in. I'm also playing with a Two-Headed Giant. So it's not all small stuff. I'm also playing with some bigger creatures so that later in the game, I also have a chance to kind of, to kind of win and it, it's not an, an auto loss if the game takes a little bit longer. Uh, another card I really like talking about the long game is a Thelonite Druid, which is a 1-1 one, one for 1 green and 2 from Fallen Empires. And I can tap the Druid, sacrifice a creature, and then all my forests turn into 2-3 creatures, which I think is kind of cool. I think this is one of the, the stronger cards that you don't see that often, but it can really win you the game uh, out of nowhere. Now, um, maybe it's also good to kind of mention how I spent my points, so you can spend 10 points on the um, cards with points on them. And I've chosen to go for uh, Mox Emerald, Mox Ruby, and Soul Ring. So I really went for the Mana Ramp. The decision, um, I, I did that because I just wanna go really quickly. I wanna be able to just play everything out. And also I, I figured out that looking at the amount of X spells I have in my deck, the Soul Ring could be really, really good later in the game because yeah, it just adds those two points of damage to your Disintegrate or your Fireball or whatever X spell you're playing. So. I think it's kind of good. It was a tough choice though, because I think that, for example, a Library of Alexandria would have been quite good in here. And there are, there are some other choices that I could have made, but I really chose to go with uh, the uh, the mana ramping uh, kind of plan. So I thought, you know, let's just go for the two mocks and, uh, and the soul ring. Anyway, this is uh, the deck that I'm playing with today. We talked about the deck of my opponent and that means we're ready. Let's go to the match. Game number one of our Highlander 93-94 tournament is starting. And look at that. I'm taking a mulligan here, starting with a card less. I am on the play. 
And uh, this is the first match in the group stages. So I'm playing red green and my opponent is a Robert and he's playing a mono black. And there are five people in the groups and uh, the top two will advance to the top 16. We have a total of 46 players. There is a Vampire Bats, by the way, by Robert, a card from Legends, an 01 creature that you can pump. You can give it plus one, plus O for a black mana. You can only do that twice. Look at this, Robert casting a Kumbach Witches. This is a great start for him. Remember, I mean, I'm playing red-green kind of aggro strategy. I have a lot of creatures with one toughness in the deck. Okay, this Pendlehaven helps a little, although does it really? Look at that, I'm passing again. Not finding anything here at the start of the game, which is really bad for my deck. My deck has an aggro strategy. So, I mean, a slow start is not good. There's the attack with the bats. I'm dropping to 18. And uh, Robert, of course, still on 20. I'm playing another mountain. So perhaps if I can cast like a big X spell later in the game, maybe destroying both creatures, that could help. Okay, this is an interesting card. Brothers of Fire, a card from the dark, a 2-2 two -two for uh, two red and one. And you can pay two red and one, and then it deals one damage to any target and also one damage to myself. And I can do that as often as I want. But of course, it is quite a steep cost for two red and one. But uh, I could, for example, use it here to kill the uh, the vampire bats next turn. So things, you know, things could be worse. There is a maze of if, so some more protection here for Robert. Tapping two black. Okay, there's the bog imp. So this is a 1-1 one, one flyer. Attacking here for one. So kind of going on that aggro strategy, putting me here on 17 with the attack with the bats. And uh, that's, of course, difficult for me here to make the decisions. Am I going to use the Brothers of Fire? You know, that would cost me two red and one just to deal one single point of damage. Or do I want to play something out? Of course, that depends on what I have in hand. I do have some good five drops, like a Cockatrice, for example, a Thicket Basilisk, a Two-Headed Giant. So there are some options in the deck. The question is, do I have them in hand? Four cards in hand for me. Looks like I'm going to pass the turn or not. Tapping three, four, five. Okay, tapping out. What am I going to do? Okay, there's a cockatrice. So this is a two, four flyer. And whatever it blocks or becomes blocked by dies at the end of the turn. So it's kind of like death touch, but then a little bit better because it cockatrice doesn't even have to deal any damage. You just have to declare it as a blocker or being blocked and those creatures die. Oh, there's a rod of ruin. So this rod of ruin is pretty good. One of the things that Robert can do next turn is use Rod of Ruin in combination with Kumbach Witches to kill my Brothers of Fire. So this is a little problematic for me here. So now I can use the Brothers of Fire twice. Now remember, Kumbach Witches has three toughness, so I cannot kill the Witches here. What I can do, however, is kill the Bog Imp and I can kill the Vampire Bats this turn and then attack for two. That could be an option. But I mean, this is already quite an interesting match, right? Passing the turn here to Robert. So I'm just going to wait and see what he does. I can always use my, my Brothers of Fire in response. What is he going to do this turn? Is he going to use... His Rod of Ruin and the Kumbach Witch is here to kill the Brothers of Fire. And then, of course, I can respond to that. Probably by killing some creatures up on his side of the board. Another option is if Robert uses his Kumbach Witches, I can, of course, deal one damage back to any target. So I could deal that. Ooh, this is interesting. There's a Paralyze on the Cockatrice. Really interesting to see what's going to happen here. And Robert here attacking with both, no, just one of his flyers, the 1-1. One, one. Am I going to reply to this by using my Brothers of Fire here? I am, look at that, using Brothers of Fire to deal one damage here to the 1-1 one, one flyer. So I take a damage as well, go down to 16, but the Imp is dead. And now, of course, Robert has this opportunity to kill my Brothers of Fire here. So dealing a damage to the Brothers of Fire... And then I can deal one damage back to any target. And it looks like I could deal that one damage, of course, to the bats. I think that's my best option. 
Another line of play for me could have been to just take the damage from the imp and then wait for Robert to use his Kumbach Witches because then I could have dealt two points of damage to the Kumbach Witches and one extra point of damage to the Witches because uh, the way the Witches work is that for every point of, when it deals a point of damage to to one of my creatures or to, or to myself, I can deal one damage back to any target. Anyway, two creatures down for Robert, but also I've lost my, uh, my Brothers of Fire, which is a pity, very strong card I feel in this matchup. Finding another forest, not untapping the Cockatrice. So I only have three cards in hand here. Placing a counter on the Cockatrice here to indicate the uh, Paralyze, I guess. So I'm on 16. What can I do? I've got a lot of mana. Okay, tapping. Wow, tapping six. Oh, there's a Triskelion. That is really good. So I can use the Trike here to kill the Kumach Witches. And that's exactly what I do. I mean, it is a hefty price to pay, though. And then, of course, next turn, Robert can use his uh, Rod of Rune. When he does in response, I can use the Pendlehaven, I guess. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a big price to pay. Ooh, there's even more control, the Icy Manipulator. And Icy together with that Paralyzed, that is quite nice here for Robert. So I can choose to untap the Cockatrice for four, but then he can tap it down just for one mana. So yeah, it's, uh, it's far from ideal for me here. Three cards in hand. Tapping four. Okay, there's an Urnum. So starting to play out the, the bigger creatures here in the deck. Playing out a forest. One card in hand, passing the turn probably. And then end step, we're going to see him tapping down. Look, tapping down the Pendlehaven. That makes absolute sense because now I can make the trike a 2-3, but that only lasts until the end of my turn. So now Robert can use his uh, Rod of Rune here to kill my trike. Tapping four instead. Okay, there's a Bok Wrath. So it's a 3-3 three, three with Swamp Walk. But of course, I'm going to give it Forest Walk because of my Urnum. And that is not great for me. I am going to untap the Cockatrice here. Now I have to give Forest Walk to the, uh, the Bok. So it's now a 3-3 three, three Swamp Walker and Forest Walker. The problem for me here is the fact that Robert has that Maze of If. Well, there are multiple problems, but... That is one of them. It's really hard to kind of get through. And here I'm declaring my attack. So he's uh, tapping, of course, my Cockatrice. And I'm not passing the turn. Yeah, this is really unfortunate for me. Robert, of course, can attack now with his 3-3. Uh, three, three, put me on 13. I mean, things are just not looking great for me here. There's the attack. Dropping to 13. And I wonder when I'm looking back at this, I wonder if it was a good decision to make to immediately use the trike to kill the Kumbach Witches. There was no rush. Untapping the Cockatrice as well. And that kind of shows that I have nothing better to do with my mana. You know, that's not a good sign. Oh, playing a 1-1. The Timberwolves, a 1-1 Bander. I mean, it's a nice card, but... Oh, finding a coaster under my, uh, under my uh, playmat there. Anyway... It's a nice card, but, you know, because of that uh, Rod of Rune, it's just not great. And also the Dancing Scimitar, 1-5, such a good blocker here. There's not really a good attack for me. I guess I just have to pass the turn. Here we see Robert again, of course, tapping my Cockatrice on end step. I really feel kind of trapped in this match. You know, you had that early Kumbach Witches that, that's so devastating against my deck. And then, of course, the Rod of Rune later on, the Maze of If, and then now the Icy Manipulator added to that as well. I mean, I'm really in a tough spot. And, and Robert can, of course, continue attacking here with the 3-3. Uh, three, three. And now I think what I should have done, of course, is give the, the Dancing Scimitar Forest Walk instead. So hopefully I'm going to do that next turn. That's a mistake on my part here. Let's see what, uh, what else Robert can do. 
I'm sure he's wondering, do I want to keep mana open to use the Rod of Ruin, you know, kill a creature or maybe even ping me for one, or do I want to play something out? You could even argue that playing out the Dancing Scimitar was a mistake because now I can give the Dancing Scimitar Forest Walk. If I notice, of course, but it looks like I'm not noticing because I don't see the dice uh, being changed there that's indicating the Forest Walk. It's so funny when you're looking back at these games, I'm like, why am I not seeing that? Anyway, attacking with everything here, which kind of shows my desperation. I think I could have... Um, Attacked here in a band. Then again, I do have that uh, Pendlehaven to save one of my creatures. There we see the block with the Dancing Scimitar. And now I'm thinking, do I want to use the Pendlehaven to save the creature? Or do I want to let it die? Two cards in hand. I think if I would have, would be at orbit, I would probably block the Timber Wolves because of the banding ability. Yep, it looks like I'm going to use the Pendlehaven to save it here. In response, he's going to ping it though. Still had the mana open, but that was bound to happen anyway. I guess next turn, now we can also kill the, the Timber Wolves. I'm just really in a bad position here. I'm probably going to take three again. I don't really see me winning this game anymore. Even if I would have chosen to put the Forest Walk on the Scimitar, which of course I should have done. Oh yeah, now let's see. Look at it now. <laughs> Finally. So I guess the quarter did drop at a certain point. I mean, then again, it would have only saved me three damage. It would have been on, on 12 instead of uh, 10. The problem here as well is that Robert is, is still on such a high life total. He's still on 19. I mean, it's not, it's not like he's, he's on like 10 or something. And I could kind of hope for a fireball and a disintegrate from the top of the deck, you know. There we see Robert using the Rod of Ruin here, killing my Timberwolves. One of the things he can do now as well is tap down my Urnum and simply attack for four. Put me on six. That actually wouldn't be a really bad play, you know. He still has the mace if I attack to mace back one of my creatures if he wants to. So Robert here a little bit in the tank, wondering what he wants to do. Tapping three black here. There's a Jalem Tome, so the little book. A card from Antiquities. Two and tap, draw a card and immediately discard a card. It's really good for card selection. I'm untapping my Cockatrice again. Tapping here the Pendlehaven, tapping two green. Ooh, tapping five in total. What do I have? Do I have a two-headed giant? Ooh, I've got to detonate. That's actually quite good. And now I've got to choose. I mean, Rod of Ruin is a target. Going here for the Icy Manipulator, which I understand. And also, Robert is taking four points of damage as well. So this is a great detonate for me here. Robert on 15. And the Icy is gone. I think I shouldn't attack here. I mean, Robert is really the aggressor. I could, of course, maybe attack with the Cockatrice because the Dancing Scimitar is unblockable anyway, choosing not to. I think attacking... I mean, of course, then he would have used his Maze of If. Could have attacked with both, I guess. Ooh, Drain Life! Oh, that is really painful. I mean, I was already in a really tough position, but now this drain life, and remember, Robert is also gaining life because of the drain life. So he's killing my urnums, going back up to 20, attacking me for one here, dropping to nine. Ooh, this is really bad. I think the worst of this is that Robert is going back up, you know, I at least had him on 15. But he's really in a good position. And he's been dominating this game from the start, to be honest. There's a tracker here. 2-2. Two, two. A card from the dark. Two green and tap. And then it fights another target creature. Actually, the first fight card in Magic. It works quite well with uh, Tuknir that's in this deck. But also with uh, Giant Grove, with Voiludu Wolf. It's a pretty cool card. I really like it. It's one of those cards that you kind of brew around. Anyway, we see Robert here using his Jalem Tome. 
finding another swamp. I mean, Robert could have even waited a little bit longer and kind of tried to kill me with the drain life using drain life and rod of ruin in combination. So I'm on nine. And at least I didn't take any damage, but now of course on end step he can use his rod of ruin, put me on eight. But let's see if I can maybe find something useful from the top of the deck. I mean, for example, a giant grove, and then he can use Tracker to kill one of his creatures. That would be quite nice. There's the ping with the Rod of Ruin dropping to eight, not playing anything out. That is unfortunate for me. And the problem for me as well is also that Maze of If. I mean, he's so well protected. Using the Jalem Tome. Drawing a card and then having to discard a card. So it's a little bit in the tank here trying to decide what to discard. He's also playing, of course, with Raise Dead and Anime Dead. Discarding a Gremlins, a card from Antiquities. You can use it to tap target um, artifact and also keep it tapped as long as the Gremlins are tapped. Pretty cool, actually. Phyrexian Gremlins. Because you don't have a lot of tech against artifacts in black. So it's quite nice. Tapping four black. What are we going to see here? Oh, there's a Juggernaut. That is some pressure there. Probably will have to block with the Cockatrice. Trading the Cockatrice for the Juggernaut. That is not great. Can I maybe find a Fisher? Or a Bolt? I mean, then again, it's not really what you want to do. Okay, there's a Fireball. Okay, that's, that's something. Probably go for three on the Juggernaut and for three on the Bog. Yeah, that's what I'm doing here. So killing both creatures, that's not too shabby. But of course, you'd rather use your Fireball for like a big, like a big hit directly to the life total of Robert. But he's kind of forcing my hand here. I have to do it. Passing the turn, two cards in hand. And my deck... Not really doing what it wants to do here in this game one. Robert drawing a card, discarding a card. Playing another Swamp. Only one card in hand for him, two cards in hand for me. So, I mean, I've kind of stabilized. A Rod of Ruin is a problem, but if it can now maybe draw into my bigger creatures. Or an Ice Storm or, or Stone Rain to get rid of the Maze, that would really help me here. Because remember, the Cockatrice is really a creature you don't want to block, right? So even though it only has two power, everything that, that it gets blocked by dies. Okay, tapping a red. Tapping a green. What are we going to see here for two? Sylvan Library would be quite nice. Have some card selection. Shatter. Okay, that's actually pretty good. Now I've got to choose what to destroy. I could go for the Rod of Ruin because remember, the Rod of Ruin also blocks all my, you know, all my one drops, my one toughness creatures, I mean. Cannot play them out as long as the Rod of Ruin is on the board. Another problem, of course, is that Jalum Tome card selection and also the Dancing Scimitar would be a good target. Let me know in the comments, like, what artifact would you now target with your Shatter? I mean, they all three have a value. That's probably why I need some time to think about it. I am going to go for the Rod of Ruin because in the end, that's what's slowly killing me. And again, I'm not attacking. I'm a little bit surprised here. Like, it could have attacked with both creatures. Then again, then Robert, of course, could have attacked with the Scimitar. That's probably why I'm not doing it. Don't want to take any more damage than needed. I'm still on seven. And of course, Robert already played out the Drain Life. There's a Drudge Skeleton. A card that's a little bit scary for me here is, of course... Uh, oh, look at that. Using my Tracker to fight with the Skeleton and then he regenerates it. But at least the Skeleton gets tapped and he had the mana open anyway. So kind of a funny moment here in the game. And what I wanted to say is the card I'm kind of scared of is Pestilence here. Oh, look at that. Howl from Beyond. Oh, that's such a cool way of Robert here to kind of kill the Tracker. Then again, I think, but it's, it's a really cool play, but it, it, maybe he should have kept on to it. You know, if he can get like a Dancing Scimitar through or just one creature through, he can almost, he, I think he can finish me 
uh, with the with the Howl from Beyond. But uh, it is a really cool way to get rid of the tracker. And using the Tome again. I mean, the Jalem Tome is doing so much work here for Robert. Constantly, like, trading in lands for, for spells. I mean, it's really nice at this stage in the game. Especially in Singleton, having card selection is, is really, really good. So one of the things that Robert could do here is attack with both creatures. And then actually, would that work? No, that wouldn't work. Now I want to say you can use his mace to the, the creature that I'm blocking, take it out of combat, but I think it then still dies because the Cockatrice ability is not like Death Touch. Oh, look at this. He's playing his uh, anime dead. I wonder what he's going to get back. Is he going to get back my Urnum? Oh, of course, he's going to get back my Trike. Oh, that is good. That is so good. That is so good. So technically, I'm on four now, I guess. That is bad. Gonna tap two. Okay, there's a Grizzly Bears. I mean, that's a problem with this deck. You know, it wants to play aggressively. A Grizzly Bears can be great on turn two, or maybe even a turn one if I can find one of my Moxen. But I mean, turn, what, what are we? Turn 500 in the game, then a Grizzly Bear is not really useful. And again, Robert here, you know, discarding a land card, probably getting a spell in return. I mean, he's still in full control. He just needs to find a way to kind of push through and start dealing some damage. I'm on 7, he's still on 20. Passing the turn here, so untapping everything. Three cards in hand, passing the turn. I really wonder what those three cards are. Robert now two cards in hand. He can use, of course, the book again. Ooh, he's not. He's going to tap four. Oh, wow. The Jalem Tome. The Jam Day Tome, I should say. Now this is going to be such a change in the game because now he's just drawing twice as many cards as me. We're both basically in top decking mode. This will probably give him the win. Also using the Jalem Tome. We're using both books. He's got a library over there. I mean, that is impressive. Again, discarding a Swamp, passing the turn. He is finding a lot of lands, but I mean, with the Jalem Tome and the GM Day Tome, he can just discard those, those lands that he doesn't need. There's a maze of it from my side. Oof. It's like I'm slowly bleeding out. Very, very slowly. But I think with this GM Day Tome, things might go a little bit quicker. Are we going to see a single here for two? No, an AO Pile. Okay, AO Pile is two more direct damage. So he's got five points of direct damage on the board. It's going to sack the pile to put two damage on the Cockatrice. Okay, so he's going to go for the Cockatrice kill. He's going to use the Triskelion here to kill the Cockatrice. Tapping, drawing an extra card. Tapping two more. Finding a Black Knight, so perhaps he's preparing... Some kind of alpha strike at a certain point in this game. There's a desert passing the turn. I'm not sure if I would have played that desert, to be honest. I mean, you can later, of course, feed it uh, to the Jalem Tome. Finding a soul ring here. Passing the turn. Yeah, that soul ring is not going to save me. I have my Maze of If and my uh, Grizzly Bear. That's not a lot to work with here. There's Robert still on 20. Tapping four. There's a Jade Statue. Tapping four, going to draw an extra card with the Gem Day Tome. And remember, he also has the Jalem Tome to kind of cycle through if it's, for example, another land card. It looks like he's preparing an attack here. Attacking with the Black Knight and attacking with the Dancing Scimitar. Sending back the Knight, taking a damage from the Scimitar. I'm on six. 
So close here to dying. Tapping two red and two. Okay, there's a dragon whelp. That's actually pretty good. I mean, the dragon whelp, a two three flyer, and uh, you can pump a red to give it plus one plus, uh, yeah, plus one plus. Oh, it's got the fire breathing ability. If you do it more than three times, it's destroyed at the end of the turn. Oh, there's an oubliette though. Putting the dragon whelp into the prison. Unfortunately for me, so it's uh, exiled, and I don't think I play with any answers to uh, enchantments. I don't think I play tranquility in this deck. So uh, yeah, this is bad news for me. And Robert keeps doing what he's doing really well in this game one, which is just controlling the game. Animating the statue, attacking here with the statue, the Black Knight and the Dancing Scimitar. Not attacking with the 1-1 uh, one -one Drudge. So probably going to send back to Jade. Taking three damage, going to go down to three. Remember, he still has that counter on the Triskelion. So I'm basically on two. I think I'm going to die next turn. And I don't think there's anything in my deck that can save me. Tapping a black here and tapping a desert. Demonic Tutor, sure. Go for it, man. <laughs> I figured out it was dead already anyway. One of the things he could do here, by the way, is uh, use that last counter on the trike to kill the trike. And then he could, I wanted to say, find another anime dead, but of course we're playing Singleton, so he cannot do that. He also already played out his Drain Life. So I wonder if there's a card in there that can just immediately deal three points of damage. He stepped out now anyway, so it's not going to happen this turn. So really going through his deck... Trying to decide what to get. But I mean, he's already winning. There's not really a card that I can think of, but we'll see. We'll see next turn. So he's passing the turn back, so I'm going to untap. Finding a Mistress Factory. And passing the turn. So Robert untapping here. So let's see what he looked up with that Demonic Tutor. I'm quite curious. Tapping two black, a sinkhole. Okay, so he's going to destroy the maze. And that's uh, the end of the road, I think. Looks like he's going to tap even more. So he's going to draw a card first. Okay. Looks like he's really enjoying his, uh, his victory. Now he's animating and now he's attacking. There he goes. So swinging in, I think, is there a way for me to get out of this? I'm on three. So I'm going to animate the factory. Probably going to block here the, the two powered creatures. That would mean I take two damage. I'm on one and then he kills me. Yeah, picking up my cards. Then he kills me with the, uh, with the Triskelion, right? Because I could block the Jade Statue and the Black Knight. But then they still take two damage from uh, the Dancing Scimitar and, of course, the Triskelion. I would go on one and then he can take the one counter off the trike to kill me. So game number one here going to Robert and I have to say Robert you were winning it from the get-go but uh, I managed to stick into it for a long time now we have no sideboards that's a good news here so all we're gonna do is shuffle up and we will catch back up with you in game number two game number two is about to start and of course I'm still on the play this time no mulligan so starting with seven look at this opener Forest Mox Ruby, there's a Felwer Stone. Okay, this is what I want to do. Hopefully next turn I can have a four drop. Let's first see what Robert is going to do in his first turn. There's a Swamp and just a pass. Okay, this is perfect. Let's see if I can ramp into something big. Maybe an Urnum, that would be uh, ideal. Tapping four. Okay, Giant Spider, not too bad. Two four creature, the first creature in the game to have reach. So it can block creatures with flying. Very flavorful, of course, being a giant spider. There's a desert by Robert. Desert, again, a good card against my deck, but of course it's not going to do much against the spider. So I can swing in. Hopefully I can find perhaps another mana and play another bigger creature. Like Two-Headed Giant or Thicket Basilisk. Attacking here. Putting Robert on 18. 
playing a taiga. Tapping four. Okay, what are we going to see for four? Ooh, there's an if biff a freak. This is a really good card. A card from Arabian Nights with a built-in hurricane effect. I can tap one green to deal one damage to each creature and each player. So each creature with flying, that is. Oh, and look at that. He's going to flip straight away the Chaos Orb. Probably here on the if biff a freak. Yep, that's a hit. And the if biff is a 3-3, three, three, by the way. Dying here to the Chaos Orb. Really nice flip by Robert. I mean, it's bad to lose the If Biff, but the good news is that now the Chaos Orb is at least out of Robert's deck. Of course, a very powerful card for him. Let's see what I can do next. Only two cards in hand, it seems, or perhaps three after the draw. So I'm kind of running low on resources. Yeah, three cards in hand, attacking for two. Putting Robert here on 16. And playing another creature. Oh, this is quite good. The Whirling Dervish. The problem, of course, is that desert. Whirling Dervish having protection from black, making it a really good card in the deck. But I need to get rid of that desert. Let's see what Robert can do here for three black. Keeping the desert untapped, probably because he wants to use it against the Whirling Dervish. There's a wall of bone. Ooh, this is kind of bad news for me. The Wall of Bone, a 1-4 wall, and for 1 black you can regenerate it. Beautiful art, a really nice black-bordered version here of Robert. And this is what I like about Highlander formats, you know, 100-card singleton formats. You get to play these cool cards, right? Cards like Giant Spider, cards like Wall of Bone. It's just really, really nice to, uh, to play with them. Here we see a regrowth on the If Biff Afrit. This is really good. Of course, if Biff can fly over the wall, and it also has that built-in hurricane mechanic that I can use to deal damage every single turn. So it's a really strong card. Three cards in hand for me now. Let's see what Robert can do in his turn. There's really some pressure. There's a black mana battery. Beautiful art by Anson Maddox. It's a card from Legends. It taps for a black, and you can also put mana battery counters on it. That you can then uh, turn in uh, turn in for black mana. So tapping four here probably to cast the if biff afrit. There it is. And again, no attack for me. Second turn in a row that I cannot attack. So the wall of bone is doing work. But now Robert needs to find a way to get rid of the if biff again, or perhaps play a flyer. He has Sengir vampire in the deck. He has a nightmare in the deck. He's got enough mana to play both. Ooh, there's a Tetravus. That is good news for him. This is a 4-4. That is a really good answer here from Robert. 4-4 Flyer. That can stop the if biff. Let's see what I can find here. Tapping to a red and a green. I have a lot of two-drop creatures in the deck, but I also have a Shatter, I believe, in the deck. So perhaps I can play a Shatter here on the Tetravis. That would be a really good, good deal for me here. Because then it could take care of the Tetravis and attack with the if -Biff. Ooh, it's a Barbary Apes, though. 2-2 two -two Vanilla, the Grizzly Bears of Legends. There's not really much else that I can do. Cannot attack here with the if -Biff. Using the Taiga for, ooh, a Birds of Paradise. I'm a little bit surprised about this play because, remember, the If Biff has a built-in hurricane effect. So I can pay a green, deal one damage to each player and each creature with flying, meaning that with the If Biff, I will end up killing my own Birds of Paradise. So not quite sure if this is the right move. There we see the Jade Statue being played by Robert. I wonder if Robert is going to attack here with the Tetravus. Probably is not going to since he's on a lower life total. Perhaps I played out the Birds of Paradise kind of as a chump blocker, expecting Robert to attack here. I'm not quite sure. Or perhaps I'm not planning to use the uh, ability of the If Biff. There is an Iron Claw Orcs, so really gumming up the board with a lot of creatures. 
The problem is I need to go and find some, some way to get rid of some of the creatures on the side of Robert. Robert here, by the way, using his black mana battery, putting a counter on it at the end of my turns. That's quite nice to see. You don't see these cards often, so I'm really enjoying seeing a black mana battery on the battlefield. It's also kind of risky for me because if Robert, for example, later in the game draws into his drain life, he could perhaps make a, a huge drain life with the counters from the black mana battery. One card in hand for Robert. And remember in game one at a certain point, ooh, I'm using my uh, Birds of Paradise here to produce a green mana to use the if biff to deal one damage to everybody on the end step. Again, I'm a little bit surprised that, okay, I'm using it, why not use it twice? You know, remember, if biff is a 3-3, three, three, it can take two damage, it doesn't die. So being very conservative here with the if biff, playing another forest passing to turn. And Robert again using the mana battery, so it's sticking up now to two. There's a tap of three. Ooh, disrupting scepter. That is very annoying for me. He's probably going to use it here straight away. So disrupting scepter, three to cast, three and tap to use. And then you're forcing your opponent, me in this case, to discard a card. So I have to get rid of one of the two cards. This is not great. Oh, Chain Lightning. That is so strange. What I could have done is deal one damage to every creature. And then, of course, also deal one damage to the, uh, to the flying creature. I mean, to the Tetravis. And then play the Chain Lightning. That's a play I could have done the previous turn. So I'm really surprised here that I didn't do that. And now I have to pay the price for that with Robert using the Disrupting Scepter. I'm also really curious now what that other card is. Has to be a good one. Oh, look at this. And now I'm playing the Bloodlust on the Tetravis and then using my If Biff for one to kill the Tetravis. I mean, that works too, but you know, I'm not really that happy with my line of player. I think it could have done a lot better. But anyway, uh, the Tetravis is probably going to die here unless Robert can, can find some kind of trick. Seems to be a little glitch on his side of the screen, perhaps. Because I believe I'm playing the Bloodlust here on the Tetravis. So remember, Bloodlust, a card from Legends, one red and one, gives target creature plus four, minus four. And the toughness cannot go uh, lower than one. So that means that the, it turns the Tetravis into an eight one. And then, of course, I use the If Biff Ifrit to kill the Tetravis. And so the Tetravis dies, goes to the graveyard here. And again, I think I really missed an opportunity here. If I would have used the previous turn to kill the Tetravis with the Chain Lightning and also then attack with the If Biff, I could have done some damage. Perhaps also could have used the Bloodlust in some kind of way to deal some more damage. Anyway, it is what it is. So there is the pass turn. So I'm going to untap, upkeep, draw. Of course, Bloodlust being in an instant. One card in hand now. I do have that Disrupting Scepter kind of forcing me to do these things now uh, straight away. Attacking for three here. Ooh, Robert is already on 10. Not playing out the card, so perhaps it's a land. And that I want Robert to invest uh, the three mana into the Scepter. Tapping two black. There's a Kumbach Witch, is the card that was so good in uh, game number one for Robert. But there's no target for him right now. Tapping three, it seems, or not untapping again. So I wonder if he's going to use the Scepter. Tapping the cards there, looking at the Lance, and he is using the Scepter. And I'm losing a Dwarven Catapult. Dwarven Catapult is a card that's uh, from uh, Fallen Empires, an instant. It's kind of like a Fireball, but worse, because you can pay a 1 red and X, and then it deals X damage, divided equally amongst the creatures of the opponent. So I could have played it here for 5, but it's rounded down, so it would have dealt 2 damage to each creature of Robert, 2 damage to the wall, 2 damage to the Kumbach Witches. So it wouldn't have done anything really for me. And here playing the Brothers of Fire again. I mean, 
Maybe I'm being too critical about my own play, but I think I should have paid at least one green to deal one damage to Robert here with the if biff Freed. That would have put him on seven. I mean, I hope I don't forget to attack now. Am I considering going full on with an alpha strike here? Robert, of course, being on eight, I can attack with the if biff, put him on five. There I go with the if biff for free, so choosing not to attack with the other creatures. So he's on five, passing to turn. So I'm playing it a little bit conservative, but it really looks like I've got game uh, number two here in the pocket, unless Robert can do some, uh, some very incredible magic to get back into this. I guess step one is take care of the if biff for free. There's a Library of Alexandria, it's a very powerful card, but not when you only have one card in hand. Not going to do much for him at this stage. And Robert is probably really thinking, his brain's running on full cylinders, trying to find a way out of this. Passing the turn here, and now I'm finally using that Forest on end step, what I should have done the previous turn as well, dealing one damage to us both. So I'm dropping to 14, Robert dropping to four. So now I can attack him through the air to put him on one and then use the if biffs ability to finish the job. There I go. Putting him here on one and then using the forest. And that's it, game number two is going to me. That means it's one, one, and we're gonna shuffle up for an all decide decisive game number three. Game number three, here we go. So of course it's Robert on the play after losing that second game. Look at this opener, Black Vice. Ooh, going to go down to 17. Let's see if I can just play out cards as quickly as I want to. No, I cannot. No one drop for me here. There's the pass, another three points of damage, dropping to 14. Hopefully I have a two drop. There is a mountain. Come on, I gotta play out something. Elvish Archers, Barbary Apes, Grizzly Bear, just to name a few. Iron Claw Orcs, I've got a lot of two drops. Felwer Stone, anything? Dragonfly. My deck is filled with two drops, but it looks like nothing is happening. Nothing is coming out of my hand here. I'm already on 14. Does that mean that next turn I'm gonna drop to 11? This is a horrible start for me. Ooh, I am tapping something. Okay, good. Earthquake for one, okay. Oh man, I'm in desperation mode. You really don't want to play Earthquake at this stage in the game, but you've got to do what you've got to do. I mean, Earthquake can be such a good card, such a powerhouse, but um, yeah, I'm forced to play it now. Robert's Vice really doing work here. Oh, and he's playing an Ivory Tower. Oh my Lord. Oh, this is really bad. Anyway, taking more damage here, two damage at least instead of three. Dropping here to 11, because of course I also took a damage from the uh, Earthquake. Oh my goodness. Okay, tapping a green. Come on, I gotta do something. Double green, no, untapping again. Okay, there's an Asp. So a card from Arabian Nights, a 1-1. One, one. It's got a pretty cool ability when you attack, it deals a damage, but it also leaves a counter. It's not a poison counter, but um, your opponent gets a counter, and if that opponent doesn't pay one, mana before his or her upkeep, then you take an extra point of damage. There's a Bog Imp, the 1-1 one, one Flyer from the Dark. Robert, four cards in hand. I have five cards in hand, dropping to 10 here. Okay, playing a land. Hopefully I can play out another card, finally disabling the Vice. It has done so much work here for Robert. Remember, this is the all deciding game, game number three. Okay, there's a giant spider. That's actually quite good. Not attacking with the asp. So keeping the asp here, but I'm of course on 10. Robert's on 19 at the moment. But at least I've got four cards in hand, meaning no damage for me next turn. That's something. I mean, in general, with the deck I'm playing with, I'm not really that scared of seeing a vice, but yeah, the deck's actually operating a lot slower than I anticipated when I was building it. Five cards in hand. 
And that's, of course, the thing with, with Highlander and old school singleton formats. It's, it's not as consistent as you would hope. Oh, this is really good. A tracker 2-2 two, two from the dark, 2 green and tap, and then it fights another target creature. So I can use the tracker to kill the Bog Imp here next turn. Problem here for Robert. And I'm a little bit surprised that I'm not attacking with the spider. Perhaps I'm really trying to defend my life total here, realizing I'm quite low already. There's a terror. Gonna take care of the tracker. I mean, it's not great, but at least the terror is a really good card in Robert's deck, and that's now out of the way. There's a Mox Emerald, and there's the attack with the Asp. So offering a trade. He's taken the trade. Tapping five. There's a Cockatrice. I'm a little bit surprised about my attack here with the Asp because what I could have done as well is just attack with the Spider, right? And he probably wouldn't have blocked. He would, would have taken two damage and then played a Cockatrice because with the Cockatrice, you can block the Flyer. So yeah, a little bit surprised. There's a Demonic Tutor here by Robert. Ooh, wonder what he's going to try to fetch. Oh, he's going for a Library of Alexandria. Ooh, that is a pretty cool, but also risky decision for him to make. I mean, of course, he's on 21, so he's pretty high in life. He now is, I believe, five cards in hand with the Loa, or is it six cards in hand if, I add the, if we add the Loa to that? I think he'll probably need to wait a few turns before he can use it. So that means he's got to take some damage. Of course, it does work really, really well with the Ivory Tower. Shuffling his deck here. I mean, it's an interesting choice. I, to be honest, I didn't see this one coming. But maybe he's got more cards in hand. Maybe the dice there is not accurate anymore. That could be the case as well. Putting everything back. Shuffling is done. I mean, shuffling with these 100 card decks takes time, <laughs> understandably. Playing out the Loa straight away. Didn't have a land drop yet, passing the turn. I mean, then again, you know, remember, Robert missed a few land drops, or actually, yeah, missed one or two land drops, so he's low on mana anyway, and Loa does give you mana, and it has that added value. Ooh, look at this, though, a Stone Rain. Taking care of business, that's unfortunate for Robert. Attacking here for four. Putting him on 17. Two cards in hand, passing the turn. Robert gaining a life from the tower, going back up to 18. I mean, he's got time. He's facing two creatures, yes, but he's still pretty high up in life. Tapping three. What are we going to see? Hypnotic Spectre. 2-2 two, two Flyer. I mean, it does mean that I've got to keep one of my creatures uh, on blocking duty. Of course, I don't want to take any damage from the Hippie and losing her card. Just attacking with the Cockatrice to 2 for Flyer. Putting Robert here on 16. There's a pass turn. He's going to go back up to 17. So this is going quite slow with that Ivory Tower, actually. Three cards in hand. There's a Swamp from Robert tapping four. Ooh, a Jam Day Tome. That is really good. So he probably had the Tome in hand already when he picked up the Library of Alexandria. That would have been really sweet for him, having and the Jam Day Tome and Ivory Tower and Loa all together. That would have been really, really good for him. I mean, I have to try to put on more pressure on the life total. Tapping three here, two forests and a mountain. Okay, there's a lure. Okay, this is pretty good. Now I can attack with both. Lure means that he has to block it. Attacking with both creatures, that means the hippie is going to die. Robert old tapped out. Nothing he can do against it. And he's taking two points of damage. Yeah, this lure is really, really good. Passing the turn here back to Robert. And of course, Lure Thicket Basilisk is even better, but hey, you've got to work with uh, what you have. There's a Juggernaut hitting the board. 5-3. There's a Lightning Bolt, though. And I mean, I really, really have the answers this, uh, this game, right? I'm, I'm finding the Stone Rain for the Loa. I'm finding the Bolt to quickly deal 
with the Juggernaut. And that means I can keep pressure on attacking for four here. Robert dropping to 11. And I mean, he's really in trouble here. He had an amazing start with the Vice. But after that, we didn't see much and I was able to remove most of his creature threats. And now passing the turn back to him. I mean, he is... Uh, it looks like he's on 15 here. Ooh, playing a Bloodlust here. So dealing extra damage here. So that means he takes four extra points of damage instead of 11. He's going to drop here to seven. So I think what happened here is that I kind of thought, hmm, wait a minute. Like Robert already took the damage, but I was kind of thinking, do I want to play the Bloodlust? Yes or no. And I decided to go for it. Putting Robert here on 11. Uh, sorry, on seven. Oh, and look at this. A Storm Seeker. Uh, putting Robert on three, and it's almost done here. That Storm Seeker was really good to Bloodlust and the Storm Seeker, dealing so much additional damage. I mean, he was on 15 not too long ago. There's the Tetravis, but that's actually, well, it's helping a little. It has to block, of course, the Cockatrice next turn. So the Cockatrice is going to trade probably for the Tetravis, and then I'm going to put him on one. Or do I have something else? Tapping five here. What do I have? Oh, there's a Dwarven Catapult. So that's going to deal four points of damage to the Tetravis. Going to kill the Tetravis. There's the attack. And that's the end of the line here for Robert. And Robert here thinking that he can still block, but actually he can kind of miss here the Dwarven Catapult, I guess. Attacking here. Let's see if he has anything. That's it. So winning the match here. And who would have thought, remember how I started this game three with the Vice on the table. It got me all the way down to 10. But after that, I was able to dominate the game, winning my first match here in the Highlander 93-94 format. Ooh, that was a close call. Here we can see the deck of my opponent, Robert. Really a beautiful deck. Managed to uh, to get this one with a 2-1 in the first uh, round here, the first match of the tournament. Now, if you like what you see, stick around because next week I'm going to show you the second match that I played in the group stages. So there are five uh, players in the group stage, including myself. So I'm going to play four matches. And if I win enough, then I can uh, move on to the top 16, the top two players move on to that top 16. And next week I will be playing against Ishan and Ishan has actually kind of the same deck as me. It's a mirror match. He's also playing red and green. He's made a few different choices than me, maybe better, maybe worse. We're going to find that out next week. Let's see who is luckier, me or Ishan. So it's gonna be a red green mirror match battle. Now, uh, before you click away, beautiful deck photo, by the way, Ishan. I just, I love these singleton deck photos, don't you? Like all those cards, it's super cool. Anyway, before you click away, please take a moment to like, share, and comment on this video. All this is for free and really helps the channel move forward. And also, you can become a subscriber of the show if you are not a subscriber already. Please hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. Okay, thank you very much for doing that. And before you click away, I, there's one thing that I still would like to share with you, and that is the Timmy Talks Patreon page, because you can become a patron of the show. And if you do, you can also join these online events. So if you like the tournaments that I organize, please consider becoming a patron. And of course, by becoming a patron, you're supporting the Timmy Talks show. You know, you become part of the show, you finance it. Uh, which is sweet. I think it's sweet. It already starts just for $1. So take a look at uh, patreon.com slash Timmy Talks for all the information. And if you become a patron, your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video. What end scroll? This end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?
Ik het als ik het als zomba kan zien.